Well, good morning. We want to uh, welcome you to the Fort McLeod Alliance Church this morning. For those who are viewing online, we, uh, we trust that uh, you're going to be having a great day. And we want to also uh, extend a warm, happy Mother's Day to those who are, are celebrating with their families today. We're going to open up our worship service this morning with Ancient of Days. Like we said, we want to welcome you to the Fort McLeod Alliance Church this morning, and uh, just uh, bow in a word of prayer with me as we open up our service. Dear loving God, we thank you so much for another day, uh, the day that you have made, and there's so much that we do have to be thankful for. We thank you for this country that we live in, and uh, even though we see a lot of uh, chaos around us, uh, we just pray that as we are free in this country that you would just give us that uh, that sort of strength and power as we carry on and as we uh, tackle the things that you have for us in front of us and we just pray that uh, that uh, the leaders of this company would uh, co- uh, country would uh, would also seek you in whatever they're doing and, and we just pray that we also thank you for the day that it is that we celebrate with our mothers we we thank you for them and we also recognize that it, it, it's sometimes a painful time for others and we just want to lift them up to you as well we want to pray for them we want you to uh, just we pray that you would comfort them in this time when it's a uh, it's also it's it's a great reflection through the provisions you've made but also sometimes a challenging one we want to lift everybody up that's uh, that might be hurting this morning that might be in pain or in need we just uh, we want to lift them up to you pray that you would strengthen, heal, and guide. And as we pray for your wisdom, insight, guidance, and discernment in our lives, we commit uh, us into your service and this service also 
that it would touch every life and everybody who's watching. We want to commit the morning in your hands, and we pray in your precious name. Amen. I'm going to give you a second to uh, just reach out to those who might be around you uh, through your devices or whatever that may be. Just give everybody a warm greeting. Wish the mothers happy Mother's Day, and uh, we're just going to give you just one second to do that before we carry on. Actually, as, as you're doing that, I'm just going to highlight a few things. We're, we do have communion this morning, so our service is, uh, is split up just a little bit differently. And I know that there was a, a text and, uh, and things for you to be aware of that for the timing and get, to get yourself pre- prepared. I'm just going to highlight a few things for your announcements for this morning, the things that are, that are happening. Um, so the Zoom Bible study on Wednesdays at 730, um, there's an invitation invitation link needed uh, from Pastor Kevin. So those who are interested in doing the Bible study on Wednesday, uh, just be in touch with them. And, and, and that can be a, a, it's another great way to connect uh, when we're separated like this. So keep that in mind for Wednesday nights at 730. Uh, and there's uh, going to be this coming week for the, uh, the council and the, the elders, there's going to be a joint meeting this Thursday night. So uh, if you're, if you're participating, keep that in mind and we'll, uh, we'll gather here on Thursday night for uh, for that meeting um the youth and blast uh it's it's as per leaders right now so if you're in any one of those programs be in touch with your leaders say hey what's going on this week and uh, that's kind of a week by week thing i know there's been planning there's been other things that have gone on and, and it's been a little bit of, of a challenge just with the separation but the events are continuing they're happening so just be in touch with them as they as they are each either reaching out to you or you with your your network uh, we encourage you to do that as well. It's, it's just part of the, the uh, ongoing programs that we have that uh, we want to facilitate for you uh, as our weeks go by. Um, also, through the uh, challenges we have through the separation and not being together here, uh, we just want to encourage you as well through your regular giving, if that's what you, what God's uh, uh, prompting you to do. There's, there is, uh, there's the... Uh, e-transfer opportunity there and it's uh, uh, you can reach out to the office if that's something you want to set up the uh, e-transfers are to uh, uh, fmac finance at gmail.com so that's uh, again reach out if that's a a form of giving that that you would like to entertain or haven't already done uh, that's an opportunity as we're separated for you to continue faithful giving so we can continue doing the things that we need to do in reaching our communities at a, a really a time when when things like this get crammed and and strained that uh, we want to continue through that form of worship as well there's uh, through this week there's a, a ding dong baby shower and that's a, a it's like a drive by uh, for Agnes and, uh, and uh, Braden boot now there was a me email send out so we encourage you that uh, to to do that it's a, another form that we can through uh, uh, when we don't have the opportunity to get together for us to continue to support and to and to encourage that way so that will be uh, held uh, you can leave a baby gift with them you you know you ring the doorbell and, and leave so that's a, an opportunity that we can encourage them as well uh, you can contact the office for the times or when that uh, when that's going to happen and those are uh, just again a few things I know there's other things going on and and again through the times when we are restricted we encourage you to reach out and uh, we don't want to be complacent in that we don't want to allow that to depict how we do fellowship with one another we encourage you guys to support to reach out and to connect with those in our church community as uh, as there's a lot of things that we don't see that are really challenging and we uh, we so look forward to seeing you face to face again. That uh, it would be a would be a great time, as I run across different people at uh, at times when, just in our regular weeks or, or times, it's uh, it is really encouraging. And I know that each one of us miss that very much. So we look forward to a chance when we can all be back together again. We're going to uh, continue to worship this morning uh, through music, and we encourage you guys as always just to just to sing it out. The whole earth 
is filled with your glory, Lord. Angels and man adore. Creation long for what's in store. May you be honored and glorified, exalted and lifted high. Here at your feet I lay my life. In my heart, in my heart, there's a fire burning. A passion deep within my soul, not slowing down, not going cold. An unquenchable flame that keeps burning brighter, a love that's blazing like the sun, who you are and what you've done. And as the fire keeps raging on, so your praise becomes my song. The whole earth is filled with your glory, Lord. Angels and men adore. Creation longs for what's in store. May you be honored and glorified, exalted and lifted high. At your feet I lay my Thank you. 
silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose, every power that thou shalt choose. Take my will and it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 27. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it.
Well, good morning, and we are glad that we can join with one another during this time of worship this morning and this time of sharing together in communion. I want to wish a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. And we know it's, I, I've made the comment a few times this week that you know many times us as men and husbands, we're used to uh, spending our way um, to uh, certain occasions, so Mother's Day is often a time when we take our wives or take mothers out for dinner. That's not going to happen today, um, but I expect that all across the land there will be the sweet smell of barbecues everywhere that you go, and uh, it might just be a delight just to take, take a walk and smell them all this morning, but, uh, or this afternoon. But happy Mother's Day to, uh, to all the mothers out there, and trust that this week will be a week that we will enjoy God's presence and minister to one another, be encouraging to one another. Um, I love the creativity that we have going on in our church family. Is there the uh, the ding dong baby shower? I know when uh, I was a kid, we would do ding dong things, but we weren't leaving any gifts behind. Um, so this is a a, a novel approach to uh, to something like that. Um, Want to encourage us just just to be re continuing to remembering one another and to pray for one another. If you have your church directory. Go through your directory, pray for some of those names. I want to encourage you to add one element to your prayers this week. And that's if you're praying for somebody in our church family, send them a text. Send them a text or something that's just a, a note of encouragement saying, hey, I was praying for you this morning. And if we have everybody in our church congregation praying for a few people in the church and, uh, you know, different names in our church directory, and you send a note, then, then we will have a spirit of encouragement that comes over our congregation this week. And, and I just want to challenge you to do that, that uh, as you're praying for one another, just to, uh, to take that extra moment to send um, a text, an encouragement. When I was, uh, was pre-cell phone days, pre-texting days, I remember the church that uh, I was a teenager in, we used to have encouragement cards in church, and we'd, uh, we'd fill out a little note on the encouragement card, it was given to the ushers, and the ushers would distribute them after the service, and you were, you were always excited to get that, that note, where somebody had noticed something, or somebody was praying for you, or encouraging you. So, uh, that's, my, uh, that's my challenge to add to your devotional life this week. Well, when I was a kid, I mean, still sometimes act like a kid, but uh, when I was younger, I really enjoyed playing sports. Now, not so much watching sports other than, than, than a bit of hockey here and there. I'd rather be out playing, and I really enjoyed sports. Uh, but I really could also resonate with what my favorite Christian comedian is, Ken Davis, and he does this little bit on God's sense of humor, on what it is when God gives a fiercely competitive spirit 
and puts it into a body that can't do much about it. And that's something I could resonate with because that was, that was pretty much me growing up. I did, didn't have a lot of eye-hand coordination, um, but I love to get out there. If we were in the field, we'd be playing football. Uh, we, spent our, uh, we spent our winters, we spent our summers uh, street hockey, floor hockey was my favorite. I couldn't skate very well. I didn't have the, the strong ankles for that. Um, but, but also, I mean, bless her, my mom didn't realize when she bought me skates as a little kid that they needed to be sharpened. And nobody told her any differently. So I was learning how to, to uh, skate on skates that uh, weren't very sharp and didn't learn until I was an adult that you needed to sharpen the things. So uh, that might have had something to do with my inability to skate well. But I, I liked games that didn't require much eye-hand coordination. Because if you passed me the ball or passed the puck and I had to aim at something, more times than not, I was going to miss. And so for me, the, the, the positions I would usually play with sports were defense. I'd be in the defense position because I could run around a lot and get in people's way. I didn't actually have to be very accurate with high co eye-hand coordination. Like any other kid, I mean, I love to get up front. I love to play forward, but the place that I was best, that I made my best contribution, was usually in that, in that defense place. Now, I want you to remember, some of you can think back. Do you remember when you played sports as a kid? Do you remember there was always at least one guy on the team? And, I mean, he was good. Granted, he was good. But do you remember there was always at least one guy on the team that never seemed to know how to pass? Never seemed to know how to pass the ball or pass the puck. It didn't matter how open you were. He was always trying to make it work for himself. And sometimes the rest of the team was just the supporting cast to, to his sports or her sports heroics. Now, if you don't remember who that was, I mean, sorry, it, it, it might have been you. But anyways, my favorite hockey player growing up. Now, you got to understand, I grew up in northern Alberta in the 80s, so some of you will groan, but my favorite hockey player to watch growing up had to be Wayne Gretzky. I mean, to watch him as a kid, to watch him on a breakaway or to slip one into the goal from behind the net, it was like watching art. In sports, when you look at his career, I mean, he was a true leader. He, has, he still has the highest uh, goal-scoring record, um, of all time, but even more intriguing to me is his assist record. Wayne Gretzky still holds the highest career assist, 1,963 assists, more than double his goal record, and 700 more than the, than, than the runner-up. I think what people enjoyed in watching him play was he was a true leader on the ice, because in spite of all the things that he did that scored, he had this ability to make everyone on the ice look better. He had this ability with his assist record, he, could, he saw other people. He noticed how other people could make the play. And I talked a little bit last Sunday, just a few comments in a different context, a, a, a little bit about leadership, and that really is a lot of what leadership is. It's being able to bring out the best in those around you. Leadership and people who are leaders are often high-capacity people. And what a leader does is a leader seeks to mobilize resources, whether it be people, materials, or time, towards the accomplishment of a stated goal or a stated vision. Good leaders know they can't do it all themselves. And so they seek to recognize and empower the gifts of others to fulfill their part. High-capacity people look and see and try to find out who it is that's open and how they can make them perform to their best. Now, all these comments this morning, all these, these, these stories are meant to set up some of the teachings that I want to look at in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, if you have your Bibles, it's in the New Testament. If you're not sure where it is, go to your table of contents, find the page, look it up. Uh, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, many of you are familiar with that chapter because it's a chapter that deals with spiritual gifts. And we want to take a look at that this morning, um, but perhaps in a little bit different way. Uh, we often go to, these, to, to this chapter on spiritual gifts very individualistic. 
very personalized and ask us ourselves the question, what are my gifts? What am I supposed to do in, with my life? What are the gifts that God has given me? And this morning, as we look at the passage, I want us to go from an individual or personalized mindset to seeing how God has given us gifts within community and how they function together. But before we go further with that, and uh, as we look at God's Word in preparation for partaking in communion, let's, let's just pause and, and pray together and ask God to, uh, ask God to be present in, in, uh, in our worship and in our looking at His Word today. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this opportunity to worship with your church family in the various places that we find ourselves. Lord, we wish we could all be together in the same, same place today, but we pray that in you we would be united with one heart and one mind and one faith. I pray, Lord, that as we worship you through your word, as we pre prepare to uh, worship you through the partaking of the Lord's Supper, I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit um, would fill us, would speak to us, and speak through us. Be glorified in this time of worship through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> A central part to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is meant to move us past the individual. It is meant to move us past the personal and help us to notice how we operate together in community on the same team. Sometimes that's a little harder for us to picture when we're not physically as present as we would like to be. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12 speaks about how we notice and how we empower others to live within all that God has created them to be. And this was a, something the Corinthian church struggled with. And we've done a lot of the history. We've, been, we've spent quite a bit of time in 1 Corinthians. I think we have one more sermon that we're going to look at next Sunday. But we've seen this, this group of believers as ones that Paul has challenged really to grow up in their faith. To move from a place of immaturity, which tends to be very self-absorbed. And as I've said before, there's nothing wrong with being immature. The problem is when we stay that way. We all have a place of immaturity, and we grow up from it. That's just part of the journey we're on together as believers. They struggled, and one of their issues within their church was, well, who's the better? Who's, who's the one that we should be looking to? Who's the leader? Who has the better gifts? Who's the more important player on the team? And I want us to see something from, from this passage. Now, I did a three-part sermon on spiritual gifts uh, last year. And so, there's aspects of it I don't want to talk about this morning because I've been there before uh, with us as a congregation. But if that's an area that you're interested in, in hearing more about, send an email into the church and I will get our administrator to find those MP3 files and, and to email them to you. And, and, and you're welcome to, uh, to have those as a resource. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 begins... Paul says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. He's going to teach them something about spiritual gifts. And each segment through this chapter emphasizes something different about spiritual gifts. Well, concerning spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be uninformed. And he carries on to talk about the Holy Spirit and how no one speaking in the Spirit of God can say Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except for the Spirit of God. Basically, what in these first two verses, we are told that the Holy Spirit is our confession of faith. The Holy Spirit is the source of our confession of faith. Spiritual gifts come from the Spirit. And when we become Christians, the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, unites with our spirit, comes into our life, and begins this work of spiritual transformation and empowers us for service. The Bible says that for by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no man should boast. Then it carries on after that verse to say, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, God didn't just give us or prepare for us to do certain tasks without equipping us to be able to do those tasks. 
And so God, through the Holy Spirit, has imparted to each individual believer one or more spiritual gifts. They come through the Holy Spirit that resides within the life of every believer. Romans 8, 9 says, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Romans 8, 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Then again, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. This morning, you might have religion, but coming to Christ brings us into this intimate connection with God through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. And that's what makes us believers in Christ. That's what, that's what makes us Christians, the work of the Spirit that transforms us to be holy, to be like Jesus, and to do works of service in his name. Verse 4 to 11 goes on to the next segment in this chapter. And it says, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of service, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation, the big Bible sounding word, manifestate to, to shine forth, to reveal. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And then he carries on to give a list of, of uh, uh, a, a sample listing of a number of different spiritual gifts. The Bible lists all kinds of spiritual gifts. Now, there isn't one spot where there's a complete list given. Every time there's teachings on spiritual gifts, there's a sampling question is often asked, are these the only spiritual gifts or are there more? How do we look at it? I like one uh, theologian puts it this way. He says, any ability that is empowered by the Holy Spirit and used in ministry, in any ministry of the church, is a spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts are not natural talents. They may begin as natural talents, but it's when the Spirit of God gets a hold of that gift in our life, He can transform it. You may have a natural talent of being a good teacher. That doesn't necessarily transform into the spiritual gift of teaching that has a spiritual impact within the kingdom of God. There's a difference between natural talents and spiritual gifts. You may find that you have a spiritual gifts in your life that God empowers you with that are different than your natural talents. Bible says to each one, each one, now each one means you. Wherever you are this morning, however you're seated, whatever, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit. Gifts of the Spirit are given, not just for you, not just for your own edification, but the verse says, for the common good. A couple of observations on spiritual gifts. One, they're more than natural talents. Second, they are given by the Holy Spirit through which we reveal Jesus and share in the ministry of the church. Thirdly, verse 7 says again, to each one, that means you. You this morning, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have one or more spiritual gifts that have been imparted into your life. Another observation, gifts are earned. Or, sorry, let me go back. Gifts are not earned. Nor are they marks of spiritual maturity. Gifts are given by grace. We don't earn gifts. Gifts are not earned, and they're not a mark of spiritual maturity. The Holy Spirit imparts them to us just as he determines. Verse 11, all these are empowered by one in the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Last observation that... that goes into the direction that I want to head this morning. Spiritual gifts may be expressed with different intensities and different capacities at different times. Notice what it says in verse 4. Now there are a variety of gifts, all different gifts, but the same Spirit. Then he goes on to say there are a variety of services and there are a variety of activities or workings. Three different things are being talked about here. There's a variety of spiritual gifts, there are also a variety of services or spheres of ministry in which those gifts may be performed. 
You may be given a spiritual gift, and the sphere of ministry might be among adults, might be among youth, might be among, among children, might be in a prison, might be in a hospital, might be in a workplace, might be among seniors. You're given a spiritual gift. There's a variety of gifts, but there's also a variety of services, a variety of places where those gifts may be manifest. And then he says there are a variety of activities, or some translations say workings. Like one, one uh, Christian author, Ray Stedman, writes this, that what that is referring to here is the degree of power by which a gift is manifest or ministered on a specific occasion. That there is a variety of capacities or the ways that gifts are manifest that are different on different occasions and even within different people. So, for instance, the, uh, the big extreme example is you may have a gift of evangelism. You may, be a, you may be one of those people that you share your faith very naturally, and people seem to respond and give their life to Christ. We have a few people like that within our church. Now, they may not have a gift of evangelism like Billy Graham did, but that doesn't mean that they don't have this gift. And it doesn't make them more or less than Billy Graham would have been because the Spirit gives the gifts, the services, and the workings, the capacity, the empowerment in different ways at different times. Sometimes if you have a spiritual gift of teaching, you may teach on one occasion and you may see the Spirit empower that teaching in a different way on different occasions. It doesn't mean that the Spirit is not at work, but there are different gifts, different services, and different workings. Now, I say this because it's important for us to understand there are greater or lesser capacities given to serve within the giving of spiritual gifts. The reason that's important is for some of us, there's a temptation to say, if I'm not able to do it like Billy Graham... Well, I'm not going to do anything. If I'm not able to use my gift of helps and service like this person, then I'm not going to do anything. The teaching here is that the Holy Spirit decides the proportion or capacity that a gift will function within our lives. The question is, will I be faithful with what God has given? We go back to the parable of talents, where one is given one talent, one is given uh, three talents, one is given five talents. God didn't expect from the one that he gave two to the same as the one that he gave the more to. He expected them to be faithful within what the Spirit had given. Now we move on from there. That's often the very individual portion. We study this chapter and we say, what are my spiritual gifts, how it relates to me? But when we come to verse 12 and 13, there's a shift that takes place in this chapter. For just as the body is one and has many members and all the members are of one body, through many are one body. So it is with Christ. And Paul gives this illustration, and he says, I want you to understand that as individuals with gifts, you are part of something bigger. You are part of the body of Christ. And Paul introduces the notion of the body that has many diverse and individual parts, but has it through one spirit, the Holy Spirit. Verse 14 to verse 26 we see how these gifts relate to one another. You may have the gift of helps. You may have the gift of mercy. You, you may have the gift of wisdom. You may have the gift of knowledge. You may have the gift of serving. You may have the gift of pastoring or teaching. How do they work together within the body of Christ? And there's actually a contrast that you see when you look at these verses. Paul says in verse 14, for the body does not consist of one member but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. Just because they proclaim it doesn't mean that it's true. There's an interesting contrast that takes place here. And we see in this first section, in this first section, I might call the doubter. 
I might call the person who is timid or insecure of their value and their place within the body of Christ. Listen to what this person hypothetically is saying. If the foot should say, because I am not, because I am not this or because I am not that, I don't belong. And Paul says that's not true. That might be your perception, but that's not true. Just because you say, I don't have what the hand has, I'm, I don't belong. And Paul says, and that would not make it any less part of the body. He goes on to say, because I am not an eye. And you can imagine, you can visualize this. Maybe it's your own experience. It's Paul, there's a contrast that takes place here. He's talking, uh, he's giving an example of the doubter, the one who's timid, who's insecure. Possibly those who have a more marginalized experience within the church that don't feel like they fit in or belong. Just because I say I am not, I don't belong, that doesn't make it true. Now look down in verse 21 and you're going to see the contrast. Verse 21, Paul goes and he says this, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. This is a different kind of person within the body of Christ. You have some within the body of Christ that might sit back and say, Because I can't, I'm not part and I don't belong. But then there are some within the body of Christ that whether they would actually say it or express it would be communicating, I have no need of you. I mean, I'm the I after all. He goes on and he says, or, or if the head should say, I'm the head after all. I, I, don't need any, I, I don't need you. This is where Paul is giving an example. The contrast is here. One part, he's talking to those who are the doubters, the timid. The second part, he's talking to the self-sufficient. The one who says, I can do it by myself. I don't need others. In fact, you might even be slowing me down. Both of these contrasts speak to how we relate to one another within the body of Christ. As we read it this morning, maybe you identify with neither of them. Maybe you identify with more one than the other. And we can see sometimes the challenges that come into place depending upon the gifts that we have been given and the capacities that we have been given by the Spirit, by His sovereign choosing. But how do they work together? Paul actually goes on and gives some action steps. Verse 22 to 26. He says, on the contrary, he says, I want you to understand something here, um, particularly if you're saying, I have no need of you. He says, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker, not that they are weaker, but they seem to be weaker, are indispensable. And the parts of the body we think are less honorable, we bestow greater honor. There's an intentional effort here that is given to actually elevate. It's funny, as, I, as I read this, I, I thought of the, you know, you remember the game you used to play as a kid? Uh, would you rather lose the use of your arms or the use of your legs? Would you rather you lose the use of your eyes or your hearing? <coughs> He gives some action steps here. He says, within the body of Christ, particularly those who have higher capacity gifts or abilities, there's a special effort that needs to be made. He says, the parts of the body we think are less honorable, we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. I've known I've wanted to preach this sermon since I first started 1 Corinthians. It was back in January when we first started, and I was studying and preparing and during that, I think I shared that I was invited to be uh, one of, I think, about 200 
300 participants on a national forum that was being put on. Um, our district coach wasn't able to go, and he asked if I, would, uh, if I would participate on the online forum. And it was about how we engage the world with Christ, how we as a church continue to, to be relevant, and all kinds of various conversations. I was part of one that looked at what that looks like in rural settings. But there was the opportunity on this forum to uh, check in in other conversations, and, and I took that opportunity. One of them caught my attention. One of the conversations that took place was, was called this, promoting communities of belonging for people who experience disabilities. And this is where I want to go in trying to apply this passage in 1 Corinthians this morning. There are sometimes people that have physical disabilities or limitations. There are sometimes people have mental or emotional uh, disabilities or, or issues that they struggle with. Sometimes it's cognitive. Sometimes it's their ability to think and to process stuff. And they struggle with these kinds of things. I actually sometimes think those with physical challenges receive greater social validation than the ones who have disabilities that are not quite as readily seen. On this particular website, on this particular conversation, there's one post that spoke to me in light of my readings and my preparations in 1 Corinthians and was reading these passages already. And the person that wrote the post, he said, she, uh, she said this. She said, people may begin to get involved in the lives of others with disabilities, but think only of care in one direction, from themselves to the people with disabilities. They do not consider inviting the person with a disability to use his gifts or service, nor do they consider entering into friendship with one with a disability. I spent quite a bit of time thinking about this phrase, how we minister and how we relate, and, and thinking about even within church settings, how we have people that struggle with the experience of feeling marginalized while being part of Christian community. You know, we have people, it's even more, it's probably exasperated during this season of isolation. But we sometimes have people, even within our churches, that feel invisible for a variety of reasons. As I read this, as I was thinking about this passage and read this post, I actually responded to it. The observation that this person was making left me thinking of what I have seen in the church over 37 years. And, and I want to share some of the thoughts that I, that, that I wrote with that. And it's not intended to beat ourselves up. I'm not in any way wanting to beat up on the church this morning. But it's an observation that I want us to consider um, with our mutual interactions with spiritual gifts. The Spirit says He's given to each one something that's meant for the common good. I wrote this, it's a little bit long, but I want to read what I wrote. Our churches often function on a project or program-oriented basis that values efficient execution of what we are doing and not so much the being parts. Paul's theology around spiritual gifts states, but in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. If we truly believe this and apply this, then we must look, then we must look for how God is contrib contributing to the life of the body through the gifts of those whose physical and cognitive challenges may not fit into the efficient execution of programming of ministries. This takes a change in how we both look at people and how we determine what meaningful contribution to ministry looks like. It sometimes means that we have to slow down and not just value seeing things get done. We have to be and not just do. We must not simply minister to those with physical and cognitive challenges, but be ministered by them and in so doing, validate both their belonging and contribution to what God is doing in and around us. For many who are left sitting on the sidelines, 
They struggle with whether anyone wants what they can offer. God brings a richness and depth to our churches and ministries when we follow 1 Corinthians 12 and take notice and invite the contributions of those who cannot function with the same physical, emotional, or cognitive efficiencies as perhaps the majority. This has been on my heart and mind for, for a while. We live in a hyper-performance-based culture. And we often put too much value in the products and the efficiencies of what we do, even within church settings. And sometimes, we don't promote as well as we could the richness of what God has put in the lives of those that don't necessarily seem to fit in as easily. Listen again to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. See, there's a contrast in this, pot, this passage. There are some that say, you know what? I don't belong because I can't do the thing that the Corinthian church elevated as this is what makes you important among us. Because I can't do that. I don't belong. I don't fit in. I don't have a place. And it's contrasted with those who had those type of gifts. Not that there's anything wrong. They're, they're meant to be used. They're powerful gifts within the body. But those that God has given strength to, those that God has given capacity to have a responsibility to use that strength and capacity to encourage the giftedness in those around them. What is in this passage speaks to me in two parts of the contrast. The first is this. You don't get to sit back and say, I guess no one notices me, I'm invisible, so I won't bother. You don't get to do that. This passage doesn't allow it. Just because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less so. You don't get to do that. You might sit back here and you say, Pastor, I resonate with what you're saying. I'm invisible. I don't feel like I fit in, so I just sit back. Paul doesn't let you do that. You don't get to sit back and say, I guess no one notices me. I'm invisible, so I won't bother. Keep putting yourself forward. And in many cases, you need to ask someone for help. You need to ask someone. You need to look at some of your ministry leaders. You need to look at some of those in the church and say, you know what? I'm not even sure what gifts God has put into my life and how he is calling me to contribute and serve for the common good. Believing the Spirit has done that for each one, as the Scripture says, you may need to ask, and people may need to help with that, and that's okay. We sometimes have to shift in the way that we look at ministry, and I've had to learn that in the last number of years. Um, I've had a conversation with a few people um, where, where I've said this. We, we are now in what I would say is the smaller end of a medium-sized church. We're not a small church. We're, 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 at this, we're kind of at the lower end of a medium-sized church. Most of my years as a pastor, I've been a small church pastor. I've been at the front line of just about everything that's been going on in a church. Been at the front line with other volunteers doing stuff. If you ask me what the difference is, I would say that as a small church pastor, I produced more. I taught more. I did more Bible studies. I preached more. There was more production as a small church pastor because I was at the front line of so many things. One of the things that I've had to learn, and it's still, it's a learning curve for me still after uh, three and a half years, is now I'm not on the front line of everything that happens in the church. And the role shifts to God. The places that you have gifted me to do well, I need to put my best into it. And then I need to fulfill the call of equipping others. How do you encourage others? How do you pass the puck? 
and notice when somebody else is open. That's what this passage speaks of. You don't get to sit back and say, I guess no one notices me. Keep putting yourself forward. God has deposited something in your life. You're responsible to discover what it is and to keep moving forward in seeking to use it, hone it, and serve with it. But this passage also speaks, I would say, even more powerfully to the higher capacity people within our churches, those in areas of leadership. How will they notice? How will they raise up? How they, will they empower and pass the puck and help others discover and live out their God-given giftedness? Now, you know what? The product might not look the same as if you did it. But does that matter? Really? There are times to score the goal yourself. There is. God has put those gifts in your life. Use them. But our ministry isn't just the product at the end. It's how we show Jesus, even out of seemingly weak vessels, in jars of clay, so that the excellency of the power involved may point to Christ and not to us. We're going to take part in communion together, where we hear Jesus saying, this is my body, which is for you. And how I wish this morning that you could look around and see one another, to see parts of the body of Christ. Jesus says, this is my body broken for you, and his body was the foundation for our faith. It's what makes, brings us into a relationship with God. It was what brings us to that forgiveness of sin, and we enter into that new life in Christ. But I wonder if it's too much of a stretch to look around and say, this is my body, which is for you. This is my body, which is for you. And each part, each part is a gift. We have a gift in the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And the communion table was meant to bring us together in community. That's why he said, do this. Do this in remembrance of me. So that we remembered the body broken for us, Christ. But that we would also be brought together and see the body that we are a part of. I want to invite you as we, as part of our worship through the word, through music, we worship through the Lord's table. And wherever you are this morning, I trust that you would know the grace of Jesus that comes through his body broken for you. But I invite you to look past that to see how he has also made you part of of a body and given you a place to belong. That for me was one of the key things really in bringing me to Christ as a teenager. There's so many goofy things about me as a teenager. There's many goofy things about me still now. But I wanted a place to belong. And when I came to Christ, I became part of a church that was a goofy church. I didn't realize how goofy it was and how messed up it was until I was a few years older. But they loved me, and they gave me a place to belong. They nurtured the gifts that God had put into my life, and they helped shape who I would continue to be in Christ to this day. And I'm so thankful for that body. This is my body, which is for you. I want to invite you wherever you are right now. If there's somebody in your group, if you're in a small group or if you are in a family together, I would like to invite somebody in that group just to pray in thanksgiving for the body of Christ that was broken for you. And just as, as Rob plays, give you a few moments just to pray and to enter into this worship through the body.
This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. His body was broken to make us part of his body. His blood was spilt that we might be children of God. Wherever you are in your group right now, I invite somebody, whether the same person or somebody different, just to pray in community together in our many different places and thank God for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that's represented in the juice that we drink together. Please join with me as we pray. Same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Our Father in heaven, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, I pray to you, our God, I thank you. I thank you, Father, that you sent the Son. I thank you, the Lord Jesus, that you sent the Spirit. And that because of your work, because of the cross, we are part of the body of Christ, each and every one of us who turns our heart and life to Jesus Christ. Lord, as we have acknowledged our sin, we have acknowledged our separation from you, we've acknowledged our need for what the Lord Jesus did on the cross. We, by faith, walk as children of God. Thank you for that new life that we have in you, the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for the new life we have in you, for the spirit that dwells within Thank you for the gifts that you have deposited into our lives that give us purpose. Thank you for the community that you have made us a part of, your body, which you still look at us and say, it's for you. In Jesus' name. Seated above, enthroned in the Father's love. Destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned, but softened as if he did. All authority, every victory is yours. All authority, every victory. Of our prayer. 
praise you are the king Jesus awesome in power forever awesome and great is your name you are the king ruler in hell speaking the father's plan sending us out light in this broken land all Verses 10 to 14. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. be mindful of us what do you see it's worth looking our way we are free in ways that we never should be a sweet release from the grips of these chains straining from the weight my heart no longer can be from singing all that is within me cries for you alone be glorified Emmanuel oh 
God with us. And all I sing a brand new song. The debt is paid, these chains are gone. Emmanuel, God with us. don't deserve your glory still you show a love we cannot afford like hinges straining from the weight my heart no longer can keep from singing all that is within me cries for you God with us, my heart sings a brand new song, the dead is paid, these chains are gone, Emmanuel, oh God with us, oh such a tiny offering, compared to Calvary, Nevertheless, we lay it at your feet. Such a tiny offering compared to Calvary. Nevertheless, we lay it at your feet. And all that is within
And now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. whole earth is filled with your glory, Lord. Angels and men adore. Creation longs for what's in store. May you be honored and glorified, exalted and lifted high. Here at your feet I lay my life. In my heart, in my heart, there's a fire burning, a passion deep within my soul, not slowing down, not growing cold. An unquenchable flame that keeps burning brighter A love that's blazing like the sun Who you are and what you've done And as the fire keeps raging on So your praise becomes my song Is filled with your glory, Lord. Angels and men adore. Creation longs for what's in store. May you be honored and glorified, exalted and lifted high. Here at your feet I lay my life. Spill with 
with your glory, Lord. Mountains bow and oceans roar, yeah. Creation longs for what's in store. May you be honored and glorified, exalted and lifted high. Here at your feet I lay my life. 